the uh, wooden windows and uh, roof line on my house <laughs> are absolutely decrepit and need replacing. Um, but before I choose a supplier, the, uh, the roof line double glazing conservatory sort of industry has a, a very poor image and you don't have to look very far to find some horrendous stories. So to avoid that, or to attempt to avoid it, I, uh, being a complete ignoramus of the whole business, I decided that I would, uh, I would investigate what this was all about. Uh, names, materials, regulations, you name it. So that uh, when I uh, was facing <laughs> a salesman, I wasn't... Uh, I wasn't fobbed off by some, some glib promise. Uh, there was much more to it than, than I ever, <laughs> I ever, ever thought. Uh, so it was quite complicated, the ventilation. Um, but anyway, I hope it. Uh, if you're intending doing this, uh, there's information in there which may be of use to you. Um, but uh, we'll take it from there. Hey, now you can see the de decrepit state of these soffits and, and fascias. And similarly up there in that corner. So it's, uh, it's long overdue. The first question was to decide what to replace it with. Was I going to replace it with wood or, or PVC? Well, it was pretty obvious to me it was going to be PVC because I absolutely hate painting window frames and roof lines. So that was the, the decision made. Um, I mean, if unlike me, your, your roof line is in reasonable condition but you hate painting, you might just decide to, to clad it, that is, you got a thinner uh, PVC board and you quite simply stick it onto the, the front of the fascia. Uh, so that you, you don't have that painting problem. But uh, it seems hardly worthwhile for me. I mean, one of the things about sticking plastic on top of wood is uh, the ingress of moisture would cause the uh, the wood to rot and you, you'd be back to square one. So for me, it was a bit of a no-brainer really. Rip the whole lot off and, uh, and replace it all. Um, so that's what we're about. <laughs> so the first thing I set out to do was find out what all the parts were. <laughs> For those of you who know about roof lines, uh, then please excuse this. It, it's, this is for the complete innocent. <laughs> so this is the uh, construction of a typical roof. I mean, today they make these complete frames in the uh, some factory somewhere, and and they and they bring them readily as, ready assembled. This is uh, roof is normally built by joiners, and these are the various bits. These are the rafters, which you put them down there. This is the wall plate, sits on top of the wall. And these are the joists, which run across above the ceiling, and these are the purlins, which sort of keep everything spaced out. Yep, ladybird. <laughs> Come on, Betty. Move yourself. And the uh, the purlins occasionally stick out beyond the brickwork on the end of the house, which uh, we'll talk about 
a bit more up later. And of course this is the uh, ridge board, runs along the top. And these are the typical parts of the uh, of the roof line. This is a barge board. This is sort of goes up the gable end and it's normally attached to the ends of the purlins. Now not every house has one of these. Uh, in some houses the, the purlins don't protrude beyond the end of the brickwork so you won't have that. These are sort of relevant bits. This is a soffit which runs sort of underneath. This is a fascia which is on the front. That's obviously the gutter. And this is the box end that fits on the end. Sort of seal off the hole behind the fascia and the soffit. If you're having the roof line replaced, then obviously one of the things you have to consider is ventilation of the roof. The space between the upper floor and the roof itself. Um, in pre-1996 houses, the felt which ran underneath the tiles or slates on the roof, it was impermeable and uh, it didn't allow water to escape. And you get a lot of water vapour in houses from cooking, from having showers and baths. Uh, just from sort of ordinary human activity uh, and it rises through the, the house and if you don't have any ventilation then it, it condenses in the attic um, which can cause major problems from obviously if anything you've got stored up there particularly things like paper or um, photographs um, condensation obviously damages them but worse than that, you, you can end up with, well, probably the worst scene is if you get dry rot, where, well, it's misnamed. You do, in fact, <laughs> you do, in fact, need dampness for dry rot, which is a fungus which attacks the timbers in the roof, and that, <laughs> that can prove to be very, very expensive. In uh, houses, from 1996 onwards, the, uh, the felt underneath the tiles tends to be sort of permeable. It's a, it's a bit like Gore-Tex, the, these materials you get in outdoor clothing and tents and so on, which allows water vapour to pass out, but doesn't allow water to pass in, so that's a little bit better. Nevertheless, you do need ventilation, and there are regulations which uh, which apply to this. Building regulations. Um, I can't remember the number, but I'm sure if you go on the internet, you'll find it. I think it's BS five zero two zero, but uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> anyway, just have a look at the uh, the three typical rooms which you find on houses. And if you are of a technically minded sort of person and that's why we found a lot more about roof ventilation but <laughs> I have to warn you it's quite complicated um, if you're going to have this done uh, best to be guided by a supplier this is the uh, pitch roof which you find on most houses these days which has a pitch between uh, 15 and 70 degrees that's this angle here and you've got the insulation there uh, runs above the ceiling. So between the ceiling of your bedroom, so your, your uh, you know, bungalow, it's all rooms I suppose, <laughs> you get a cold space. In other words, your attic is cold and therefore you're mo more likely to get uh, a damp problem in your attic. And so you have to have ventilation in the soffits and for one of these roofs a primary roof vent 10 millimeters if you want to know more about that you have to go on the internet because it's quite a complicated business but anyway that's what you need and 
This is a shallow sort of duo pitch roof um, where this angle here is less than 15 degrees and again you get this cold space in your attic because the heat is trapped by the insulation and in one of these you need a primary airflow of 25 millimeters so you need more ventilation for one of these if you've got a shallow pitched roof. Some people have quite a steeply pitched roof um, and they've converted their attics into living space, bedrooms or offices or whatever uh, and the insulation instead of running across the top of the ceiling as it wouldn't do in a normal house the insulation runs up between the rafters and then, it's, uh, then the ceiling is there and they've got what's known as a warm living space so the attic is warm and they need this uh, primary airflow of 25 millimetres And of course there are all sorts of other places <laughs> much older with sort of thatch roofs and slate roofs and whatever but uh, I don't know enough to cover those. So that ventilation then is very important. So what does this primary airflow mean? this 10 millimetres and this 25 millimetres and this little piece explains it um, a 10 millimetre primary airflow means that you have to have a, a continuous ventilation running the full length of the eaves that's back and front to allow a flow of air to pass through um, which is 10 millimetres wide and of course if it says 25 millimetres primary airflow then it means a, a continuous ventilation running the full length of the eaves which is 25 millimetres wide. Now three main ways of providing this ventilation all involving uh, either the fascia or the soffits. Um, some of the soffits come with the ventilation already in continuously, little slots all the way along. Um, some soffits have holes drilled in them with a, a vent attached to it. And then uh, there's another one called over fascia. Uh, ventilation um, where the, uh, you've got a continuous vent along the top of the fascia uh, which is very much favoured because you can't in fact see it from the ground and uh, I'll just illustrate that by uh, three quick pictures which I've purloined from elsewhere the choice is obviously up to you. It's not a brilliant photograph, but this is continuous ventilation in the in a soffit. Very similar to uh, the soffit which uh, came off my came off my house. One of the problems with it, of course, is it. Uh, when it becomes dirty, it's very difficult to clean these, and then you get all uh, sort of black. Which can be, what some people might consider, a little unsightly. And this is a, a second way of ventilating the roof space through the soffit. These are, you just drill a hole and stick these little vents in. 
Um, they're just a push fit. Ideally, they want some kind of <laughs> some kind of adhesive on it. Uh, my neighbour over the road, he had problems with birds pulling these out and then using the hole as a nest. <laughs> he had to go around and uh, remove them all and, st and put some adhesive and stick them all back in. And then depending on uh, what kind of roof you've got, there's obviously the sort of spacings of these is important. And this is the third way, and uh, it seems to be highly recommended. In that instead of the ventilation being in the soffit, it sits on top of the fascia. A sort of continuous run all the way along there. The other thing to notice on here is the eaf protector. This is a felt which runs under the tiles and instead of it coming down and overhanging the gutter because it tends to uh, perish and crack these are the sort of up to date <laughs> um, solution to the problem these are easy, just a little plastic sheet Sort of bends over, overhangs the gutter, sticks up under the felt, and they just overlap all the way along. But the nice thing about these overfacing events is that uh, they are invisible, you can't see them from the ground. This is a piece of the original soffit. Oh, that was And you can see it has this uh, continuous ventilation all the way along. It's wood, it's made of wood. And all the way around the house. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is on the back is this so sort of soffit mesh, it's plastic. Uh, and it's to keep out the bees and wasps amongst other things, but bees and wasps in particular. Wasps aren't so bad because uh, they all die off in the winter time. But honeybees, they can be there for years and years and years and if you go on the internet you can see. You can see the problems of, uh, of getting rid of them. Cost an absolute fortune. And they do a lot of damage as well. Tons and tons of honeycomb all. All piled up in uh, in your roof space. If you're having uh, soffits fitted, you might continue. You might consider uh, having some mesh fitting behind them to prevent that from happening. So when it comes to ventilation, then the uh, the two best options are either the continuously ventilated soffits which you find that uh, most of the big builders use the sort of Taylor Wimpies and if you look on their houses or persimmon homes houses you'll see that they have this continuous ventilation both back and front um, or the other alternative as I say is the overfacia ventilation In the old roof with uh, felt under the uh, tiles, the felt protrudes out and overhangs the gutter. So any water that leaks through the uh, gaps in the tiles falls onto the felt, runs down the felt and into the gutter. And uh, what you find is that the, the protruded bit of felt becomes quite fragile and has to be replaced. Um, and today they've got these things called eave protectors. It's like a, a sort of plastic sheet. Um, so they lift the, uh, the bottom row of tiles, trim off the trim off the felt, the old felt, and then put these eave protectors in. This is uh, an eave protector. 
So that was all I really needed to know. But uh, it was something I was in complete ignorance of. Um, and uh, I'll make a little video of the, uh, the guys when they come and do it. So you can, you can see exactly what's involved. When the eave protectors are put in, the perimeter tile has to be slid up to get access to the felt and uh, the lower roof. And obviously to do that, you have to remove the nails which are under the second row of tiles. And you can see there the two holes, one there, one there. And when the tile is slid back down in, into its position, it's, uh, it's obviously important that this, these nails are replaced, so they've got one mechanical fixing for the tile. Otherwise what happens is, with these, the increased uh, winds and storms we get, the tile lifts and it uh, slides down into the gutter. And now there are new regulations where the perimeter tiles need two fixings, two mechanical fixings, uh, to cope with the uh, ever-increasing storms we're going to get. So you would have a, a nail there and uh, somewhere under here you would have a, an eaves clip which nails into the uh, top of the fascia. So it would have a, a fixing bottom and uh, on top. Pretty standard 5534 deals with roof, slating and tiling. And uh, it was amended in 2014. Uh, and the recommendations were that perimeter tiles and slates should have two mechanical fixings, whether that's nails or clips. And it became mandatory in uh, 2015. So if your perimeter tiles have been moved, in other words your eaves tiles or slates have been moved to uh, deal with the roof line, uh, it might pay you to upgrade whatever fixing there was on there to the modern fixing. In other words, have a, a nail put in to hold it on the button and uh, at the bottom uh, an eaves clip which actually fixes into the top of the fascia board. So it's got a, a mechanical fixing top and bottom. Particularly if you live in an exposed place like I do, where the wind absolutely howls around this house. It was quite interesting looking into it. There was a far more to it than I ever thought. Anyway, next. Windows.